The tradition of Festivus begins with the airing of grievances. I got a lot of problems with you people. Now you're going to hear about it. Welcome to Watch Mojo. And today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 behind the scenes secrets about Seinfeld. For this list, we'll be looking at confirmed and rumored stories from behind the cameras that will only make you appreciate this show about nothing even more during your next rewatch. Do you know any other cool Seinfeld facts? Share them in the comments or no soup for you! Number 10. George Steinbrenner made an unaired cameo. For many episodes, the Yankees owner was nothing but an off-screen voice provided by Larry David. Hey, Costanzo, what, what is that you're reading over there? That looks pretty tasty. It's a calzone, sir. He was portrayed as a temperamental, half-witted, chatterbox caricature of the man himself. Oh, that smell. I know that smell. That's, it's in the building. Costanza is in the building, and he's not in this office. He's got the calzone. Costanza! I got you! I'm getting you, Costanza! According to David and Seinfeld, they did get Steinbrenner to film a cameo for the season 7 finale, The Invitations, where he would convince Elaine to accompany him to George's wedding. There's even a scene where they have dinner together. I don't have anyone to talk to, and I'm not sitting at that singles table all by myself. Wait a minute, young lady. What's this about singles tables? I don't sit at singles tables. Singles tables are for losers. However, both comedians said that he was so awkward and so not funny that they had to cut him out altogether. Apparently, it was David's job to break the news. It wasn't funny. He just didn't have the funny gene. I don't remember exactly what went wrong with it, but it was a quite an awkward situation. Luckily, Steinbrenner took it pretty well. Number nine, the real soup Nazi. Red. Beautiful. You're pushing your luck, little man. This show, famously known for being about nothing, often drew from real life for inspiration. George, Festivus is your heritage. It's part of who you are. For instance, Festivus is a real private secular holiday invented by writer Dan O'Keefe's dad, and the Rye episode is rooted in true events too. Perhaps most hilariously, though, is that the Seinfeld writers made an enemy in the real-life man who inspired the soup Nazi character. He's not a Nazi. He just happens to be a little eccentric. You know, most geniuses are. <laughs> He did not think that imitation was the sincerest form of flattery. Because Jerry wanted to meet him, and I tried to explain to him, the guy is not excited about meeting you. So when the writers tried to enter his establishment after the episode aired, he berated them before furiously kicking them out. No soup for you! Come back one year! Next! What's that they say about biting the hand that feeds you? Number 8. The writers often use their friends' names. <laughs> According to the former writer Andy Robin, the writers enjoyed giving the people in their lives a thrill by just using their names on the show. For example, he shared that Kramer's mystery pal Bob Sacamano was named for writer Larry Charles' real-life friend. My friend Bob Sacamano, he came in here for a hernia operation. Oh yeah, routine surgery. Now he's sitting around in a chair by a window going, my name is Bob! <laughs> And speaking of Kramer, he's based on Larry David's actual neighbor at the time, Kenny Kramer. My neighbor was a guy who would come in, take a lot of my food, and he was a guy who didn't work, really. Or if he did, nobody really knew what he did. As in the show, the pair would leave their doors unlocked for each other to come and go freely. No, I can't eat that. You can't eat a sandwich without Dijon. Yeah, you're right. I really should keep more of your favorites on hand. <laughs> Supposedly, the real Kramer only asked for $1,000 in overall compensation. However, he's continued to profit from the show with the creation of the Kramer Reality Tour. Larry knows me like a book, and so a lot of the ingredients in me, you know, the golf, the entrepreneurism, the you know, hot tubs, raging heterosexuality, all that is me. But of course, Michael, you know, did his thing. Number seven, why Elaine's on-screen dad never returned. The first and last time we first meet Elaine's intimidating author father, Alton Bennis, is in the season two episode, The Jacket. Excuse me, Mr. Bennis. Yeah. Uh, I I'm Jerry Elaine's friend. This is George. It's a great thrill to meet you, <laughs> sir. <laughs> Although there were plans to keep actor Lawrence Tierney on as a recurring character, that all swiftly changed after some worrying behind-the-scenes behavior. He was spotted putting a knife from the set of Jerry's apartment in his jacket. 
There was a box of raisins on the coffee. Table. Did you, by any chance, take them with you when you left? Then, when the comedian confronted him about it, he played it off as a joke and proceeded to reenact a moment from Hitchcock's Psycho. As actor Jason Alexander recalled, he scared the living crap out of all of us. Needless to say, he wasn't invited back. His dad can make some people a little uncomfortable. Oh, no. Get out of here. <laughs> Number six, the theme song. For any Seinfeld fan, the theme music written by Jonathan Wolf is instantly recognizable. Somehow they decided this is going to be our outfit. One piece silver jumpsuit, V-stripe, and boots. That's it. But did you know that each of Jerry's monologues came with its own tailored musical accompaniment? This was because the timing of every stand-up set varied and the music had to be adjusted accordingly. I think we're tipping people now just for the absence of outright hostility. Wolf recorded countless versions of the tune to create the unique sounds and tempos based on the lyrical pace of Jerry's comedic delivery. The bass line for Seinfeld. So simple, it can start and stop for his jokes. And apparently the network execs were the only ones who weren't fans of Wolf's now iconic theme tune. But Larry David insisted on keeping it. The notes were, what is this music? What is that instrument? Can we not afford real music? Number five, the episode that almost wasn't. Seinfeld was known for leaving NBC execs in a cold sweat due to its unconventional approach to the sitcom universe. The show is about nothing. <laughs> However, it was the Chinese restaurant episode from season two that had even the show's biggest supporters at the network concerned. How many? Uh, all right, uh, four. <laughs> Seinfeld, four. I'll be five, ten minutes. When David told them the premise, the characters waiting for a table in real time, the execs were rather anxious to pitch it and explain it to their bosses. They even considered ending production. Well, let's just order it to go. We'll eat it in the cab. Eat it in the cab? Chinese food in a cab? We'll eat it in the movie. What? Well, where do you think you're going? Do you think that they have big picnic tables there? <laughs> Luckily, David was able to sway them and the payoff was tremendous. The episode was an overwhelming hit among critics who saw it as a groundbreaking bit of television. Meanwhile, it remains a strong favorite among fans to this day. Seinfeld, four. Number four, the scrapped episode. During a Reddit Q&A, Seinfeld revealed that they abandoned plans for an episode that pushed the limits too far. The scrapped season two episode called The Bet focuses on gun ownership, based on the real life experiences of writer Elaine Pope. The material was super dark and apparently made some of the cast rather uncomfortable. Are you some kind of tough guy? Okay, let's everybody just relax. <laughs> Everything was in place to start filming, but in the end, it didn't make it past the table read. With a gap left in the schedule, Seinfeld and David wrote a new episode in just two days. Hi, it's uh, George. George Costanza. Remember me? The guy that didn't come up for coffee. <laughs> The bet was replaced by the beloved classic episode, The Phone Message, instead. But you know, as soon as she gets in the apartment, she's going right for that machine. Well, she goes for the bathroom. That's my only chance. <laughs> Who am I kidding? I can't do this. I can't do this. <laughs> Number three, Jason Alexander threatened to quit. Season three's The Pen is the only episode that doesn't feature George Costanza. Come on, take the pen. I can't take do it. Do me a personal favor. No, favorite. I'm not take comfortable. The pen. I cannot take it. Take the pen. Are you <laughs> sure? I'm positive. Take the pen. And after learning that he wouldn't feature in it, the actor threatened to quit. George is getting upset. <laughs> he allegedly told Larry David that if he intended on writing him out of future episodes, he could just write him out altogether. Supposedly, he also snapped the series creator when he tried to reason that it was difficult to give each character equal attention every week. It's over. I'm gone. Finished. Over. I will never work for you again. Look at you. <laughs> you think you're an important man? Is that what you think? You are a laughing stock. Since then, Alexander has explained that this was driven by his own insecurities. He worried that as Jerry and Elaine grew closer, his character might get sidelined. I thought you quit. <laughs> What to quit? <laughs> Who quit? <laughs> Number two, the main cast was responsible for Susan's fate. 
In Season 7, George was unhappily engaged to Susan until she was unexpectedly and rather controversially killed off in the season finale. How did it happen? Apparently the uh, glue in the wedding invitations was uh, toxic. Apparently, this turn of events was orchestrated by the principal cast due to actress Heidi Swedberg's comedic incompatibility with the others. No, you don't love me! No, no, still love, still love! In an interview with Howard Stern, Alexander shared that she was a lovely person, just difficult to play opposite. No, her instincts for doing a scene where the comedy was and mine were always misfiring. He later clarified on Twitter that she was always open to suggestions, he just never offered any due to his own insecurities. Eventually, Seinfeld and Julia Louis-Dreyfus realized the problem too, and after an off-comment made by Louis-Dreyfus, Susan's fate was sealed. Before we unveil our top pick, here are a few honorable mentions. It holds the record for the smallest sitcom order in TV history. After the pilot, NBC only ordered four additional episodes for season one. It's not working. Not working? What are you talking about? We're just not suited to be friends. Well, how can you say that? Look, you're a nice guy. It's just that we don't have anything in common. No sentimental moments allowed. Larry David issued this decree to support the dark premise of the show. I am not your pal. What's wrong with pal? Why is everybody so down on pal? <laughs> The Junior Mint was almost a piece of popcorn. It was writer Andy Robbins' brother who suggested that Junior Mints would be funnier. What are you eating? Junior Mints. You want one? No. no. I can't see. The pilot was filmed on the same set as The Dick Van Dyke Show. Other shows filmed there included The Golden Girls and many others. I met her the night I did the show in Lansing. <laughs> There's no milk in here. What is she? What is she like? The many voices of Larry David. Most times you heard a voice off camera. It belonged to the series creator. What's going on over here? There's a beached whale. She's dying. Does anyone here a marine biologist? <laughs> Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, the producers were told to add a female protagonist. Oh, Lainey! <laughs> it takes a fervent Seinfeld fan to remember that Elaine does not feature in the pilot episode. In fact, the character was only added after NBC threatened to drop the show due to its lack of gender diversity. Moses. <laughs> but before Elaine Bennis joined the gang, their leading lady was a waitress named Claire, played by Lee Garlington. Are you sure this is decaf? Where's the orange indicator? It's missing. I have to do it in my head. Decaf left, regular right. Decaf left, regular right. There are conflicting stories about why she was dropped after the pilot, including her tendency to go off script. Nevertheless, her departure made room for Julia Louis-Dreyfus's now iconic Elaine. Oh, come yes. on! You're not doing California! Well, I came back for you. Oh, shut <laughs> up! With Elaine, the gang was now complete and, well, yada, yada, yada. Yada, 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 that is it. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from WatchMojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.